All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me adjust the lights a little bit. How would that be? I know. Is that better? Well, now people in the back would tend to fall asleep, I know, from personal experience. Um, <coughs> all right, so welcome to the 10th lecture. Three more to go. Um, and before we start, as usual, a few announcements. Now, during the self-study on Tuesday, I suggested that we spend half of the last lecture as a Q&A session. So you can ask all kinds of questions regarding anything. But then I checked the schedule of the course, and it turns out that <laughs> the last lecture was actually intended to be a Q&A session. So we don't need to condense anything. The 13th lecture, there would be no new material. I would use the time <coughs> to make a kind of a summary for, for everything we did. And I will also address the quizzes. Lots of you wanted to know the right answers and why some answers were right and some were not. Um, and then we'll probably have still half the lecture for Q&A sessions for you. So uh, please try to, to have your questions uh, in a kind of a condensed form so you can ask them directly. For instance, this slide, I don't understand the diagram. Um, so that we can have more questions for that time. So that's the last lecture before the exam. It's the exam is on the 22nd, so the lecture before is on the 15th of December. Yeah. <coughs> the quiz now. I, I don't know, is, is the quiz over now? I forgot what deadline I said. It's all right, it's over, so I can talk about it a little bit. Um, I canceled one question. That was the question uh, about the policy, integrated policies uh, versus yeah, the other types of policies, uh, because, yeah, I mean, the, the basically none of the answers were correct. Let me put it this way. I was kind of, yeah, I mean, yeah, there is a very uh, subtle semantic thing going on there, and I'll talk about it, but basically everybody got one point there for free. Um, again, I got so many emails manual input questions will be graded by me, by hand. So don't worry if you get zero points. I get so many emails, oh, I got zero points, I failed, what should I do? Uh, you should wait until I grade your manual input questions, and that would probably happen in the weekend. Um, yeah, so that's it as an announcement. Today's lecture is going to be slightly more mathematical. So those of you who wanted to have mathematics, you have it. And yet the most complicated mathematical operations that we're going to do is taking the derivative. That's all. All the equations that you're going to see are simply taking the derivative, setting it to zero, and maximizing some function. That's all. This is what um, standard economics kind of does. OK, before we start, a quick reminder. Uh, this is the self-study for next Tuesday. It's still from last lecture, the coupled co web dynamics. Um, you remember the model, it's in the, in the last lecture. Today's model is going to be the self-study for next, next week. All right. A quick summary now, uh, a more general summary for the, for the lecture, what we did. We looked at what kind of problems we're mainly concerned with, and you remember we had this kind of ill-defined, complex problems with no clear solution space, no clear algorithm to solve them. And then we saw that it's actually important uh, to have human problem solvers, basically you. Um, and that's what the MTech is actually preparing everybody for. Well, that's the ideal, at least. To be a human problem solver, to know how to tackle these problems, to know how to define the problem, first of all. Um, to define your goals, and then to implement it properly. And implementing is simply project management. All right, then the next, uh, well, the last part was controlling solutions, and there are two ways to control solutions. We saw two ways so far. One was the systems dynamics approach, which is 
we're mainly focusing on feedback loops. So you try to identify feedback loops in your system, um, and and then you see how these feedback loops lead to explosion or or dying out. And you know, positive feedback loops always go together with negative feedback loops, uh, and so on and so forth. Hopefully, you now have more experience with Vensim. You can appreciate its positive and negative sides. I certainly appreciate the negative sides, but. Um, the positive sides are that it gives you a very, very simple and quick way to see how these models that we're considering behave. It's a very quick way. If you use any other software package, the learning curve, in my opinion, is much steeper. So Vensim is a good thing as a kind of a first approach. Um, the second way to control um, these kind of systems is the nonlinear dynamics way. That is, we try to identify what influences these feedback loops. What parameters influence these feedback loops? The so-called control parameters. And these control parameters basically control the dynamics of the feedback loop and, by extension, the dynamics of your system. And we saw bifurcations, what bifurcations are. By the way, um, I was surprised to see that most people, let's say the second least successfully answered question on the quiz was what is an equilibrium point? which I thought is quite trivial. But it turns out, w if I look at the statistics, that's the least, uh, the second least successfully answered question, uh, which I don't understand why. What is an equilibrium point? Fixed point, stationary point. Does anybody know? Yes. Exactly. The dynamics of the system doesn't change. So the first, whatever way you want to put it. If you just want to be very sparse, you just say first derivative equal to zero. If you want to be a bit more conceptual, then you can say, yes, the system doesn't change anymore, and so on and so forth. But um, apparently, I don't know. It was a tough question. Uh, we looked at predictability. So... That means, uh, in our context, chaos. And please remember that chaos um, is not associated with randomness, with having random forces influencing your system, thereby limiting your, your predictability. No. The unpredictability emerges from the system's dynamics. And if you remember the logistics map, there was no random inputs there. But something is missing. You probably already saw it in your handout. So far, we didn't talk too much about economics. Right? We saw these models um, with different control parameters, uh, but there was no clear relationship to economics. We started last lecture with considering the, uh, the cobweb markets, the coupled cobweb and, and the single cobweb. Uh, and there we talked about the output market. You remember this picture where we had the market of goods and services, that's where firms sell their production, but we also had the input markets, that's the markets for uh, factors of production, that's where uh, basically labor is, that's where labor is both in a sense, capital also. So today we're going to be considering or dealing with input markets. Um, <coughs> now most of you who take courses in macroeconomics, microeconomics, even the basic ones, you would be familiar more or less with the concepts here. Um, but still, for completeness, um, let me introduce a few, few basic economic concepts. The first one is the economic theory of production. So in the neoclassical economics, and that, is, that means that um, for, for the neoclassical economists, the output of your economy, the income distribution of your economy, the wages, the prices are all set by the interaction uh, between supply and demand. That's the basic idea of neoclassical economics. You have supply, you have demand, they try to match each other, and by this process, the so-called market clearing mechanism, we set the price, we set the optimal level of production, and so on. So in this, um, in this framework, Production is nothing more than transforming the output to an input. Uh, the input to an output. So the input factors 
somehow are transformed to an output. And um, this is done basically by an abstract entity which we call production function. Right? And the production function here is given by, uh, by this f, which takes your inputs, the different x's here, and gives you an output y. Now it's important to see that um, the production function is an abstraction of the real production process. We don't concern ourselves here with the managerial or en engineering problems uh, that arise when you try to produce something. We just assume that these don't exist and we're interested in how we can allocate these inputs in a way that maximizes our output. So it's a question of allocation. We're not interested in uh, whether it's actually possible to do it from a technological point of view. Um, basically, standard economics is not concerned with this. All right, so the inputs could be many, uh, but uh, let's say the standard is to assume only two factors of production, let's say the most important two, capital and labor. Capital is all your machinery, infrastructure, buildings, facilities, and so on and so forth. Uh, and labor is basically people. And um, yeah, so capital is uh, denoted by K, and labor is denoted by L. Therefore, the production function is just this. And as I mentioned here, uh, the production function simply describes the technology behind um, behind this transformation, inputs to outputs. It doesn't describe economic choices. It doesn't describe, for instance, how consumers change their preferences or how, uh, what kind of problems man managers encounter in implementing these, these transformations. No. Where only the F just gives you the current type of technology, if you'd like. As an example, you can see a production function like this simply a linear combination of your inputs, is a technology where all the inputs are substitutes. Right? You can see that. If we remove this input, all we have to do, so if we remove x1, all we have to do to have the same level of y is simply increase x2. That's all. So inputs are completely substitutes. That is a type of technology. It's not economic choice. Another example is uh, this one here. These, so the minimum of all the inputs. Um, in this example, all the inputs are essential, so you have complementary technology, right? For instance, um, if x1 is zero, if we set x1 to zero, so we remove x1, your output would be zero. <coughs> so you cannot, you cannot replace x1 by increasing anything else because, you know, of the functional form. And then what we want to know, basically, with all this uh, exercise, is what is a pr what production function describes real economies. That's what we want to know. And this lecture is going to be about this, basically. Who has heard the following terms? Cobb-Douglas production function? Oh, not too many. Solo model? All right, that's good. Not too many. So it won't be boring for most of you. Let me introduce first a few basic notions. Probably all know them. Even if you don't know them, they're intuitive enough. Average product. Y it's basically simply you divide your output, your total output, by the total input. In that case, we have y, total output, divided by the total input uh, factor i, x i, so we get the average product. Marginal product, which is more interesting, is basically the marginal revenue, let's say the marginal contribution of each additional unit of input. So it's simply the derivative of, of your output. Right? So if I, change, if I change my input x i by one unit, my output changes by this much. Right, so if let's say well, every additional employee produces 10 more bolts, then the marginal product for the employees would be 10. Okay, now it's an empirical fact, 
that uh, the marginal product decreases over time. Or well, let's say it's uh, it kind of the returns you get from each additional unit of input decrease. Eventually, they become they could become negative. Right. So, what would that mean if the marginal product is negative? You hire more and more people. Not only are they not contributing to the output, but you actually lose money for keeping them. So you can think of bureaucracy, for instance. I would imagine there they have pretty negative marginal products. But all right. Um, yeah, so this is called the law of diminishing returns. It's an empirical fact. Nothing complicated so far. Uh, this is a picture which illustrates how the output uh, interacts with the average product and the marginal product. And it's taken from Wikipedia, in fact. If you just look for production function, you'll find this article. It's pretty good. It has a lot of details. It has a lot of links to, um, to other economic concepts. Um, and I find this, this figure to be, let's say, the best way to summarize uh, the slide so far. Production function, marginal product, and average product. So what we have here is the following. I'll try to use the other presenter. Yes. So what we have here is a typical quadratic or nonlinear production function. All right, that's also you can consider it an empirical fact. What this means, so first of all, on the x-axis we have the units of input. And in that case, we mean units of variable input. Right? We can have variable input and fixed inputs. Variable input is labor. Right? We can relatively easily vary it in the short term at least. Fixed input would be all your machinery, all your facilities, which cannot be easily varied in the short term. Right? If you need 10 more people, you can easily hire them. But if you need a, diff a new factory, you need time to, um, to build it. So um, the fixed inputs are more or less fixed. They don't change in the short term. Here we're concerned with the units of variable input. So input is variable input. What we have is um, the production function or the output of, of your uh, economy increases as you employ more inputs, which makes sense. But at some point, it actually starts to decline. Right? This is the place where the marginal product becomes negative. So you have so many people uh, that they're not only are they not productive anymore, you, you basically lose money keeping them, paying their wages, they're not producing anything. It's not their fault, by the way. Imagine you have a machine which can only be used by five people, but for some reason you've hired 20, right? They would be crowding. So uh, it's kind of your fault for hiring them. Um, right, so this is a typical production function, and we have so-called three stages. Let's, let's see uh, each stage individually. Um, now, it's difficult to see from this, from this shape here, but at point A, the production function has the steepest slope, right? So it's kind of an inflection, it's kind of an inflection point, right? If you imagine, uh, by the way, I'm going to be using the blackboard a little bit today to make things clearer. Uh, so unfortunately, that won't be visible in the recording. Right, so if I can make point A clearer, um, this is something like this. So, well, you can't really see it. So that inflection point, so-called inflection point, is the point of maximum slope. Right, so, I mean, yeah, you can't really see it, but uh, it's like that. So that means, le let's first start from zero. You start employing more more uh, inputs. The slope is zero, it increases. The slope of the production function starts to increase, increase, increase. At A, it's maximum. <coughs> but what is the slope of the production function? It's a question for you. What is the slope of the production function? Come again? Oh, the production function, I well, this is uh, the production function this curve. So if you take 
I don't know, five units of input, you would get whatever output that you know this function tells you. So you see, the slope of the production function starts from zero. You employ more inputs, more variable inputs. You hire more people. The slope starts to increase, 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 increase. Maximum is here. So again, what is the slope of the production function? Midpoint. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah, but what is it? Point A. Well, in general, what is the slope of the production function? It's the marginal product, exactly. So, in other words, the marginal product increases, increases, increases. It reaches a maximum here. What would that mean in economic terms? Well, you hire the first few people. They bring you increasing returns, right? Look at the marginal product. Now, this is the marginal product. These new people bring you increasing marginal products. So, there are synergies created between these people, right? You create one person, uh, you create... <laughs> You employ one person, then you employ one more. There would be synergies between these two people, for instance, and the total uh, the total output would would be higher, right? So there is increasing marginal products, or in other words, increasing returns uh, to scale. We'll see what this means. At that point, you know, this is just an example production function. At that point, the marginal product is maximum, the slope otherwise it's maximum, and then starts to decline starts to decline, 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 at that point it becomes negative. You know, this is the marginal product. Now let's look at the average product. Um, now, yeah, I have to write a few things here because, by the way, all the textual explanation is given in the slide, uh, but I feel that unless you see, uh, you see the equations, it's kind of difficult to understand the, the textual explanation. Not difficult, of course, but it makes it easier. So let's have a look. I, I mean, I won't go too much into writing these equations because I don't want to underestimate you. Uh, I'm sure you can do it yourself. But let's see what happens. The average product is simply the output divided by the input, right? Let's try to find the maximum of the average product. That's all. As I mentioned, the only thing we're going to do today is derivation and finding maximums. So we differentiate this. We want the first derivative of this to be 0. We get the derivative of y times x minus y divided by x squared. You know, this is just the simple rule of taking derivatives. Uh. All right. Now we want this to be zero, which means, can you see that in the back? Which means that this is zero, right? In more details, or We have this. Now, if we integrate, what we get is plus a constant is equal to ln of x plus a constant. OK? <coughs> Do you follow? Simply integrating. Which means that y. your output is now equal to to this, where c is just the sum of c1 plus c2. There are constants which can be determined from the initial conditions. We don't care about them. But now you see, this is an interesting result. Your average product is maximized when the output is equal to this. But what is that? Let's, let's focus on this. Right? This is just a line 
this is just a line with a given slope, right? The slope of this line is e to the power of c, a constant. It can be determined from the initial condition. So that's just a line. Now let's go back to the slides, or if you just look at your slides. Let me show you. Right? We want the output to be equal to a line that goes through the origin, that goes through the origin and has a certain slope. All right? Look at it again. We want to maximize, well, yes. Let's calculate the average product now. The average product is this. If we substitute our given y, so this cancel out, right? So the average product, it's simply the slope of this line. It's a line that goes through the origin, it has a certain slope and intersects your y function. We want to maximize this, which means that we need a line with maximum slope. But this slope, uh, this line should still intersect with your production function. They should still be equal at some point. And this is basically point B. And the texture explanation says that it's the steepest possible line through the origin that touches the production function. Why steepest? Because of this, we want to maximize the average product. This is the slope. It has to be steepest. All right, so this is point B. Right, and the average product, right, the average product is this. Let's calculate the marginal product. What would the marginal product be? At this point, at this point. Well, it's a derivative of y with respect to x. What is y? Y is this. It's the derivative of this with respect to x, which is e to the power of c. So you see the marginal product is now equal to the average product. And this is what you see on the figure. Simply taking derivatives. That's all we're doing. That's the point here. The marginal product, I product is equal to the average product. What would that mean conceptually? It means that every new employee contributes the average product. So if we stay at this point, if we don't employ more inputs, or if, we, if we stay at this point, the average product is maximum, and every new employee just contributes the average, right? So if every employee produces two bolts um, and there are no, um, um, yeah, so if every new employee produces two bolts, adding just new and new employees would just increase your production by two bolts, your average product would stay two, right? Two bolts per employee, so we're at that point. If you keep adding more people though, your marginal product decreases, so each new employee contributes less. Um, but the output increases, right? This is not a bad thing. The fact that the marginal product decreases, does not it's not a bad thing. It's still positive marginal product. Every new employee still contributes something positive. That's why the output keeps increasing. At point C, it's maximum. That's when the marginal product is zero. And now if you remember from your economic courses, uh, profit-seeking firm in a competitive market always operates at marginal profit or marginal revenue equal to zero. Okay, so that's the, f that's the thing. Marginal product is equal to zero, you have maximum output, and so on. So companies ideally want to be between actually point B and C, ideally at point C. So that's, that's that with the function. I spend, I think, way too much time on this. So let's move quickly through the following slides. They're actually um, easy. Returns to scale, another basic concept in economics. Constant returns, well, what is returns to scale? The question is, if we increase the f production factors by a certain factor, say by two, we double all the, pr all the factors of production, what happens to the output? Does it 
double as well? Does it triple or, or, uh, or less? So constant returns to scale, uh, you're familiar with this, I suppose. Constant return to scale is we in the, the factor by which we increase each production factor is the same as the increase in your, in your production. So if we increase all the inputs by 10%, output is increased exactly by 10%. Increasing returns to scale uh, is intuitively more than 10%. And decreasing is less than 10%. That's, uh, that's that. Again, a quick notion on elasticity. What is, um, in, in that case, elasticity not of supply and demand, but elasticity of the production function to the inputs. Again, we define it as a percentage. So the percentage change in the output <laughs> divided by the percentage change of the input is this. And it can also be rewritten as the derivative of the log. Right, derivative of natural logarithm of y is 1 over y times dy. Derivative of this is 1 over x times dx. And then, yeah, they're equal. So that's the elasticity. Um, and this was the basic setup we need. Production function um, and, and, you know, this kind of notions. Our average product, marginal product. Now we're going to consider, consider uh, given a specific production function and see what conclusions we can draw from it. It's the so-called Cobb-Douglas production function. The Cobb-Douglas production function, um, so uh, remember, I, I said in the beginning, what we're interested in is coming up with a production function which resembles real economy. Okay, and this is one of the candidates for this is the Cobb-Douglas production function. We'll see how it was derived, and we'll see why it resembles real economy. But before we start, I'll just give you the function. It's like this, right? It's uh, L, the labor to some power, K, the capital to some power, uh, and then there is a constant which we define as, let's say, productivity or technology efficiency. Now, you should be able to, to see that given how we defined elasticities, alpha is the elasticity of the output to labor, and beta is the elasticity of output to capital. Right? These are elasticities. I mean, very easy. You should be able to just calculate this quantity, this thing. First, take the derivative of y with respect to L, and calculate that, you find the elasticity of labor, then take the derivative of y with respect to k, and uh, you find the elasticity of, of capital. They're alpha and beta. I won't spend time deriving this for you. It's very easy. Um, now, how it was developed? Well, the, um, Douglas, Paul Douglas, was interested in kind of coming up with a law or coming up with a... Um, yeah, with basically a stylized fact about relating the input to the output of an economy. So he assumed that there must be some universal law which tr is true for basically all economies. Um, and what he did, he was not a mathematician, what he did, he looked at this um, data from the National Bureau of Economic Research and he found that throughout these, what is it, nine years, the share of output that was paid to labor was pretty much constant, 75%, so three-fourths. So it's pretty much constant. So this was one kind of evidence to him that there must be some governing law which links uh, input, which transforms inputs to outputs and that is valid across, across the board. Then he contacted this mathematician, Charles Cobb, and he suggested the following form. Now, why did he suggest this form? And why these numbers are one-fourth and three-fourth? We're going to see now. This is how the reasoning goes. Um, we have a certain production function, y. And uh, let's calculate the profit first of our firm. The profit 
as this as, as said here, uh, let me try to use this presenter again, is this. It's the price that you get for your output. So the price times your output. Right? This is the in other words the revenue or sales minus what the capital cost you and minus what the labor cost you. So that's minus the cost of productions. So that's the profit. It's a simple definition. Revenue minus costs. And the price and the cost of capital and cost of labor are constants that we need to identify. So let's try to maximize this profit. Again, the formula operation, taking the derivative, setting it to zero. But now since the profit is actually a function of capital and, and labor, so K and L, we need to take the two partial derivatives, so der derivating the profit with respect to K and with respect to L, in other words, the gradient, um, and setting this to zero. So that's what we've done here. Um, the derivative of, um, right, so we take the derivative of this with respect to, um, so first of all, the derivative of the production function just the production function with respect to uh, capital is this. This is the partial derivative. And we denote it by F subscript K. And um, the same thing for labor, right? The partial derivative with respect to labor is uh, L, F, L. Now, we take the derivative of the profit with respect to L. It's this. With respect to labor, right? This is zero. This would just be W. We need it to be zero. With respect to capital, again, we need it to be zero. <coughs> so what you see here is that a profit maximizing strategy of a firm would be the following. Your profit, uh, sorry, your marginal revenue, you know, this is marginal revenue of labor, right? Without the P. It's just the marginal product of labor. Multiplying it by the price that you get for this marginal product gives you the marginal revenue. The marginal revenue that you get from one additional unit of labor should be equal to the cost of one additional unit of labor or to the marginal cost. So remember, this marginal revenue equals marginal cost for profit maximizing firm. And you'll see this in other courses, I'm sure. The same thing for capital. Now, um, we take some of the output, we allocate it to capital, we take some of the output and we allocate it to labor in the next period, if you'd like. So we take some of the, um, <coughs> some of the output and we allocate it to labor. So this is your output, the revenue. We take alpha of the output, so some part of the output, and we pay our labor with this. We take beta of the output and we, we pay our capital with this. Right? So this is the total labor force that we have, the, the cost of the labor cost that we have. We pay it by this fraction. This is the total cost of the capital that we have, we pay it by this fraction. You know, this was the assumption or the empirical fact that was observed. Some of the output is taken and is used to pay salaries, some of the output is taken is used to make investments in capital. Now, if you play a little bit by this equation, so this is the profit maximizing strategy, and this is more or less an empirical fact. Um, we go to the next slide. Now, there is a small error. It's not dividing 1 by 4, it's dividing 2 by 4. And in the same, please make a note, in the same way, it's not dividing 2 by 3, it's dividing 1 by 3. I mean, if you just play with the equations, you immediately see that. So if we do that, <coughs> so let's combine 2 and 4. Oops. We combine 2 and 4. Right? What can we express from here? We can express this. I mean, you, you can play with this. We reach to this, um, to this relationship. Right, so K star, I forgot to say, K star and L star are the amounts of capital and labor that maximize your profit, right? These are the optimal amounts of capital and labor. Just by solving these equations, you can find them. So we get that. 
And um, in other words, so this is, um, if you transform this a little bit, then you get f of k divided by f here is equal to beta divided by that. In this, so remember this, this relationship. Uh, then in the same way, combining one and three, we get that relationship here. And um, now, this is nothing more than the derivative of the logarithm. Okay. So if you if you if you differentiate the logarithm of f with respect to k, we you get that the partial derivative with respect to k divided by f. Okay, that's that's nothing more. So therefore, the logarithm of f of k and l is equal to this thing. Right now, you simply integrate. We integrate that, and we integrate that, and we get this. You can check that. You can take the derivative of this with respect to k, and we should get exactly that this relationship holds. G of L is a function which depends on labor. If we take the derivative, partial derivative, with respect to k, this is zero, right? There is no k here. So this is zero, the constant is zero. All we get, I mean, we can take it. It's just, let's just do it. It's one line. <coughs> Yeah, I don't know where I left my chalk. I'll do it here now. Let's take the derivative of that thing. So the derivative of f with respect to k is this, right? This is the derivative of the logarithm. It's equal to beta <coughs> times uh, the derivative of ln of k with respect to k is 1 over k. Everything else is zero. What is that? It's exactly that equation over there on top right, right? The same thing for the second. Okay. So now we have the following relationship. Um, and look at this these two things are equal. So we just equate the right-hand sides. If we do that, um, <coughs> again, let's be thorough. All right, we say beta times ln of k plus some function plus a constant is equal to alpha ln of L plus another function plus another constant. Okay, there is no thing here, right? <coughs> so, how can we make these two things equal? Well, one way to do it is if that thing is equal to this, all right, and this function is equal to this. That's one way to make them equal. And obviously, yeah, we don't care about the constants, but we can make the constants equal to. All right, so in that way, ln of f would be equal to beta times ln of k plus the function gl, which we impose to be equal to alpha times ln of l. And this is what it says here, plus a constant, of course. So this is the constant. We don't have to set them equal, but uh, we can if you want to. But we don't have to. Yeah? Because look, they must be equal. They must be equal because the left-hand sides are the same. Right? So they must be equal. And one way to make them equal is to just impose what this function should be and what this function should be. That's one way. All right? So if g of l is equal to alpha times ln of l, and h of k is equal to that, then they're equal. Clear. All right, so this is exactly what I said. Plus a constant. Now we just 
exponentiate both sides. Just let me just finish this slide. It's really quick. We exponentiate both slides, uh, both slides, both sides, and we get that. This is the form that we saw in the beginning. And a is a constant, which is e to the power of c. It's just a constant. So let me recap how we did this, how we came up to this conclusion. We started with assuming that the firm <coughs> tries to maximize its profit. That was one thing. Second, we assume that some part of some fraction of the output is taken, is used to pay labor costs. Some other part of the output is taken and is used to pay capital costs. That's all. These two things, we combine them, we played with them, and we reach to the conclusion that a production function which maximizes profit and allocates uh, ratios of output to labor and capital looks like this. Okay? And, yeah, let me just finish this slide. We can calculate the returns to scale of this function. Let's just increase the inputs by a factor of lambda. Right? If you do that, and you use the property of the, ex of the exponent, then you reach to the conclusion that if you multiply the inputs by lambda, your output is this. This is the output. Now, if you want constant returns to scale, as this is also kind of an empirical fact, we'll see data later on, then alpha plus beta must be 1. right? If you want increasing returns to scale, it would be larger than 1 and uh, obviously smaller than 1 for decreasing returns to scale. But if you assume that it's 1, you don't assume it, it's an empirical fact that these guys observed, then we get, we get this. And um, yeah, that's all. This function also has the property that the inputs are essential. If you set any input to 0, the total output is 0. Right, zero to some power is defined to be zero. Right, so we get uh, we get the whole thing is zero. So that is how the Cobb-Douglas function was derived, and in the following slides we're going to see um, empirical validations for this. So we'll do this after the break. <laughs> Let's continue. Uh, Okay, so what I showed you is the Cobb-Douglas production function, how it was derived, why it has the form, the, this fo the following form, and then we looked at conditions under which we have constant or increasing or decreasing returns to scale. Just a visualization, this is how it looks like uh, with the following parameters. So this is capital and labor. What you see is if you hold labor constant and you just increase the capital, the output doesn't increase. I mean, it, the output still increases, but not that much. If you hold the capital constant and you increase labor, let's just look at that. Let's hold the labor constant here, the first contour line here. Labor is constant, capital increases, the production function, uh, the output increases like that. If we hold capital constant and we increase labor, the output increases even less compared to before. Which means, what does it mean in terms of elasticities? It means that in that particular case, the output, the elasticity of output to labor is less than the elasticity of output to capital, right? Which is, in fact, the opposite of what you would expect. And the reason is that, look, alpha is 0 0.35. So alpha was the elasticity of capital the elasticity of labor would be 0. Point, what is it six, uh, seven, 65 seven, yeah 65 so that has uh, repercussions for your investment decisions 
Should you invest in capital, holding labor constant? Should you invest in labor only? And probably the best thing to do is to invest in both, right? The largest increase is when you invest in both, like this. All right, so let's see how the Cobb Douglas production function can be used to, well, before that, before we see that. This is the empirical data that the two guys worked with. Uh, so these are different countries, Australia and um, different parts of these countries. And what they saw, so I actually I don't know the details what the observations are. I think these are regions within the country. So what they saw was that values of K, K was capital. Or let's say the, the ratio of output that goes to capital is this. The ratio of output that goes to labor is this. All right. And you saw that the sum, so this is alpha and beta, right? The sum is more or less constant. It's one. So that's how, uh, I mean, that's why they posited that uh, this function has constant returns to scale because alpha plus beta is kind of close to one. And besides, what you can see also here is that uh, the average... Um, uh, actually, sorry. Yes, it's the other way around. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. K, yeah, please make a note. K is labor and J is capital. So this is labor. And the average of this, where is it? The average of this is about 0 0.6. And in different courses you would encounter kind of slightly different uh, alphas and betas for the Cobb-Douglas production function. Could be one-fourth and three-fourth, could be one-third and two-third, depending on the, on the empirical data and the consideration. Here it's 60%, which is, uh, which is closer to, to two-thirds. All right. Few properties of the Cobb-Douglas production function. The marginal products are positive which is nice. So, oh, another, another typo in this slide. This is alpha over k brackets the whole thing to the power of alpha. All right, so just put brackets here to the power of alpha. The same thing here. Alpha over k brackets, and now it's to the power of alpha minus 1, not 1 minus alpha. It's a big mess, I know but I'll fix it. In fact, I mean, if you just compute this quantity, you would immediately see the right result. So in, in, in fact, yeah. All right, so these are positive. The marginal products are positive, which is nice, and they're decreasing. So if you take the second derivative, it's negative, so they're decreasing. Just a few properties. Um, now let's see how this production function can be applied if we, well, before we see that again, um, you would probably see the function in a different form, different functional forms. Linear form, as we just saw, but also logarithmic form. You just take the logarithm, that's all. And, well, yes, the computation of the elasticity, the elasticity that I talked about is now here. So you can see that the elasticity of labor is alpha and capital is beta. So that's just the computation. So finally, we can take this production function and assume that this is the production function that governs our economy, okay? And we want to see how the economy would develop. This is the so-called neoclassical growth model or the solo model, which is taking the production function, the cobb douglas production function, applying it to an economy and see what happens to the economy as you vary different factors of production. So that's basically the rest of the lecture. Um, yeah, so these are introductory remarks, not so important. Yes, the only thing to mention is that, um, that this is basically <coughs> the solo's contribution was that he assumed now that labor is a factor of production 
for some reason before him this was not this was not the case so he included labor uh, in, in into the calculations all right let's start now uh, first the assumptions of the model let's quickly jump to this equation there we have the output the total output of the country is the sum of consumption investment government expenditures and net exports in other words you, you take a given output and you try to divide it now what to do with this output you can consume all of it if you consume all of it you won't have anything left uh, for tomorrow you can invest so investment here means you invest in capital you invest in a factor of production and in the solo growth model the investment is only in the capital so the capital factor the factor of production capital not labor so you can take some of this you invest in capital which would increase your capital stock which hopefully increases your output in the next uh, in the next time period um, or as I said you can consume it for now let's disregard the government the government spending and the net exports let's assume it's a closed economy there is no trade nothing's going on in the simplest case by the way if you take uh, more economics courses for instance development economics it was an elective when I was uh, when I was doing the master's degree it's the, the course is a lot about the solo growth model extensions of the solo growth model including trade here we assume no trade closed economy net exports is zero all right but for now our output we get we take a certain output and we divide it with this we have to make a decision how much do we consume which means how much basically is lost you know consumption means we just lose it we don't we don't get any return on consumption except kind of personal satisfaction which is kind of unquantifiable or we invest it into capital so if I just draw a little diagram to make things a little bit clearer what we had so far are the factors of production K and L yeah we had K and we had L we combine these two factors somehow this is our production function and we create output all right then we make the decision what should we do with this output should we consume part of it should we invest part of it but now you may be wondering well how does C and I relate to K and L right so this is the input what produces the output and that is what happens to the output once we have it so it turns out in in this model the Im the investment is used well it's actually so this is kind of a dashed line the investment maybe I should have used a different color the investment is used oh, not labor is used to increase capital so this is the feedback right this is how our actions our decisions uh, on the output side influence the, dis the, the what happens on the input side and in the solo growth model the L is assumed to be exogenous governed exogenous so there is kind of a exogenous uh, labor supply people come to the country people leave the country uh, we we don't care about that so consumption is lost output you know it's goes to nothing investment feeds back to to capital this is uh, the relationship between the output side and the input side okay just as a conceptual overview probably I should create some diagram and put it in the slides good 
Right, so as I mentioned, the labor force grows exogenously, right there. So this is basically the, uh, the percentage growth of, of labor is constant, n. Somebody, just God maybe, uh, determines this, this n. All right, let's analyze the model further. Our production function now depends only on K and L. We split the output between consumption and investment. And remember, the decision we need to make now is how much should we spend on consumption, how much should we spend on investment. Um, in fact, um, what people are mostly interested with is what is the, well, let me first say the following. The investment is assumed to be a part of the output, right? It's a linear part of the output. So we just take some fraction from the output and we invest it back to capital. So this is S, the savings rate. So at each time period, the government has to decide how much do I save? The rest I will consume, or people in my country will consume. And the question is, what is the savings rate which maximizes your consumption? Because for some reason, maximizing consumption is, let's say, one of the most important things that people expect from a government. Um, so that's the question we want to answer. How much should we save and invest in capital so that our consumption is maximized? Now you can think, if you don't save anything, you maximize consumption today, but tomorrow you have nothing, right? So the actual equilibrium is zero consumption because your capital gets destroyed. If you save everything, you would constantly have more and more capital because you invest everything into capital, but consumption is zero all the time because you don't, you don't consume anything. So you need to find this kind of middle ground where consumption is maximized. Um, yeah, and then now we're going to, s to find this. This is the whole purpose of of the following slides. The feedback mechanism I already talked about, it's this one. You take the investment and you use it to increase your capital by the following relationship. So all the investment is simply taken and added to the capital. And of course you have to account for depreciation of capital, right? So let's say you have a battery if you leave this battery for let's two years it will depreciate and at the end of the day it won't work right depreciation uh, or for non-tangible assets it's amortization but it's the same idea the intrinsic value of something declines it's basically a physical process so this is how your capital or the feedback mechanism how it works your capital increases or decreases by the difference of what you decide to invest minus depreciation. So you can immediately see if you invest less than what the depreciation is, you cannot cover the, let's say, destruction of capital, the intrinsic destruction of capital, so your capital stock would decrease. If you invest more, your capital stock will increase. All right, so investment is simply a fraction S of your output and minus that. Now what we do next is, yes, we basically try to find the level of savings, the so-called golden level of savings, that maximizes your consumption. This is the whole purpose of the exercise. So let's see what happens. Mm <coughs> now, first we'd like to eliminate our two factors of production. We have K and L, but it turns out it's more convenient to work with the ratio K and L. And quickly I want to show you, uh, there, is no, uh, there should be three of them. No, maybe not. Let's use this one. Quickly I want to show you what happens if we use this ratio. So I will use that part. <coughs> Oops. Here. All right. 
So we have our production function, which is this. Now let's let's divide the whole thing by labor. Okay? We divide it by labor. This now, y over L, y over L would be output per person or output per capita, output per individual employee. But this is interesting now. The Cobb Douglas production function has constant returns to scale or we want we basically impose the condition it has constant returns to scale what does that mean it means that if we scale the factors of production by a given rate let's scale them by 1 over l all right 1 over l times k and 1 over l times l constant returns to scale what does it mean what what should be the equal sign be Right, we scale the Cobb Douglas production function by one over L, each factor of production. What should it equal for constant returns to scale? Yes? It so what should I write? F this over L. Do you agree? All of you? Really? I mean, K over L, 1, right? So in fact, we define K over L to be the Capita, the capital per capita, or the capital per person. You know, this is, let's say, if my country has five factories and five people living there, each person would get one factory. So this is the capital per person, capital per capita. And this is small k in the slides. So in essence, what we've shown is that if we scale the production function by L, 1 over L, the output is this. So it's basically uh, 1 over L times F, and now F, this is small k. So this is the production function per person. Okay? Now let's go back to the slides. Yes? Which term? The term on the left. No, no, the term the first of the question, you know, F of uh, one over L now K uh, comma one over L over L. The one before. This one? Yes. Yeah. No. As if you take one over L way. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. I'm happy you all follow. Good. So, this is what's in the slides. We define the capital per capita, small k. Okay? And then your output per person is just this, f of small k. Now, there is another uh, little thing. <coughs> so, 
So let me see if I should derive this for you. Let's try to explain it. Remember, here we had the following thing. <coughs> yeah, le let me derive this for you, and that's the last thing I will derive, actually. Oh, I should... Yeah. Yes, I can use that part there. So remember this equation. Okay, I will use different color. Let's say blue. The equation from the previous slide, slide 18. So we had, um, this is capital K now, is equal to investment, which is S times F of K and L minus this depreciation. Now let's divide by L again. We divide everything by L. Oh, no. Uh, what we're interested in is um <coughs> Yeah. What we're interested in is small k, how the dynamics of small k behaves. Right? This is k over L. Capital K over L. Okay? We want to find an expression which more or less looks like this. This is the capital per capita. Well, Again, taking the derivative, so this is small k. It's very small, I guess, if you see it from, from behind. So that is derivative of k times L. It's simply differentiating. Minus k times derivative of L divided by L squared. Good. Let's continue here. This is rewritten, let's, yeah, this is capital K divided by L minus capital K times L divided by L. Okay? Now, capital K dot divided by L is simply that thing divided by L, right? We simply divide this by L. So what we get is S times F of KL minus this divided by L minus capital K times. What is L dot divided by L? It's N. Okay. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's like this. Thank you. Actually, now the calculation. Who said that? Thanks. So basically, now the calculations would would be right. Right? I just take this, L would cancel out, so that's an L. That thing is still over L squared. Now, L dot over L is N. And then we just have a leftover factor of L. K star is now equal to... Um, <coughs> what is that? We know what this is already. It's S times F of small k. Now everything is small k now. I just did this here. Oh, the other board. All right. <coughs> uh, and then we have minus um, k over L. So capital K over L 
and that is n plus plus um, delta, right? Let me see. Yes. And we're almost done. What is k over L? It's small k. So this is what we wanted. The dynamics of the capital per capita. And this is the equation you find on uh, slide 19. Yes, it's line slide 19. So the next slide, there you go. This is the equation. So what is that? The capital per capita, I mean, it makes sense. This is the investment that we do in the capital per capita, and this is the cost of the capital per capita. But now the cost would be basically the sum of the cost of capital plus the cost of labor. And you can think of N as the cost of labor. Good. So let's try to, well, now this is K and the consumption per capita, the consumption per person is defined in the same way as the normal consumption. So let's try to find the stationary points of this, of this equation. So what we want to find is at what point the capital per capita does not change anymore. So it's zero. It means that each person gets two factories forever. It doesn't change anymore. Well, we know what to do. This should be zero. Therefore, that should be equal to that. It's right here. And we call the value of the capital per capita, which satisfies this equation, we call it stationary, k stationary. So this is the stationary value, uh, right? So this is it. And from here, you can is express s. And if you substitute s right here, you get that the stationary consumption per capita, that's what we're interested in, the stationary consumption per capita is equal to that. It's simply very easy, just replace S, express S from this equation, put it here, and you get that equation. Why did we do all this? We finally ended up with the consumption per capita, because we want to maximize this. Right, this was our original goal. Let's maximize consumption per capita. Again, familiar procedure. How do we maximize a function? First derivative should be zero. First derivative of this is simply f prime of k minus n plus delta. And now we call the value of k, this stationary point that sets the first derivative to zero, we call it gold. Capital per, uh, capital per person because it maximizes consumption per capita. That's golden for uh, consumerist societies. And again, familiar, familiar form. The marginal product of one unit of capital per capita should be equal to the marginal cost of that unit. Right? So this is, again, the same the same thing as we saw before. Good. This was for a general form of a production function with constant returns to scale. Now let's plug in the Cobb Douglas production function and simply calculate the actual values of k gold and k stationary. This is what we're doing now. And it's simply plugging in the right values from the Cobb Douglas production function into these equations, right? So you plug in, um <coughs> uh, you can express the production per person as this. Yeah, you simply divide by L and so on. So it's like this. This is F of K and then you simply plug in uh, f of k into all the equations. For instance, you can plug in f of k um, f of k here. R 
right? You set it basically, well, you set this thing to zero. And instead of f of k, you put a times k to the power of alpha. You make this zero, and then you calculate the stationary k, k stationary. If you calculate k stationary, it's this. So this is, what is that? This is the stationary point for the capital per capita, per person. Um, <coughs> where, so basically the capital doesn't change anymore. The capital per capita does not change anymore. This is the stationary point. The stationary value of the production is this. Uh, and now if you plug in k stationary into that equation, into that equation is here, you want the first derivative of that to be equal to this. And what you find at the end is that the golden ratio, so the capital per capita value which maximizes your consumption is equal to this. And just comparing that and that, you see that the optimal production, the optimal savings rate which maximizes your consumption is alpha. So what you basically what this means is you have your empirical data, you find the elasticity of capital, right? This is alpha. This should be your savings rate if you want to maximize consumption. This is the bottom line. You will have to do the Cobb Douglas or the sorry, the solo model as an ex as a self study in the next next cell, uh, next next uh, exercise. And then you'll really understand how these different K gold and K stationary uh, come to existence. These are some computer simulations uh, in Vensim, by the way, so you would probably have to do something like that. Let's focus on this graph, right? This is the production per person, F of K, small f of K, production per person. You see at some point it saturates. That's when we have reached K stationary. The different values represent different savings ratios. Now, it would be easier to understand all these graphs if we quickly jump. Okay, this is, this is interesting now. This is the most important graph. This is the consumption per capita. This is exactly what we're interested in. Consumption per person. And we want to maximize it. To maximize it. So the green curve is savings rate of 0.3. The red curve is savings rate of 0 0.5, and the, the green, sorry, the blue one, yes, the blue one is 0 0.3, the green one is 0 0.7, and this is 0 0.5. Remember, the elasticity, alpha, was given, and it was 0 0.5. So this equation tells us that the optimum savings rate should be 0 0.5. But we've played a bit. We don't choose 0 0.5, we choose 0 0.3, we get the blue curve. 0 0.5 is the red curve, and you can immediately see that this really produces the optimum, the largest consumption per capita in the long term. So you have to play with this. Um, yeah. The x-axis is time. This is time. Okay. All this also the mathematical analysis, considered something evolving over time and reaching a stationary state. And then we try to find out, okay, what is the stationary state? How can we maximize something? Now, what people have been using the Cobb Douglas or the solo model for is not just to see evolution over time. It's kind of a trivial thing um, because you always know that you would reach an equilibrium. But what people have been using it for is to compare different countries with different savings rates, with different capital per capita, and see basically why some countries are poorer than other countries. What is the reason for this? And this is the um, domain of comparative statics, in a sense. So you compare stationary equilibriums. You've already reached these equilibriums, and you just compare different equilibriums over different countries to see what can we what, what what can be done in order to bring one country closer to to a higher equilibrium um, this text here is just explanation of that graph and i'll just explain that graph without explaining the text well we
Yeah, maybe we, well, let's, is that confusing if I use it too much? Like this spotlight? I assume no then. All right, so this is the depreciation, depreciation of capital per capita, remember. So D is the depreciation of your capital, N is the depreciation of labor, right? Or in other words, the cost of labor. You can also think of it in this way. So this is what we have to pay to support a given capital per capita. This is the investment, that curve. So S, a fraction times the output Y. And you can imagine that the output Y would be just the same, it would have the same shape, but it would be maybe higher, it would be like this. And S times Y is just a uh, um, given fraction of it. What we know is, let, well, let's start from here, this point. This level of capital per capita. What happens is that our investment is higher than the depreciation. What does that mean? It means that we can create new capital because we cover the depreciation, but we, there's also something left over to create new capital. Therefore, the capital stock, the capital per capita would increase in the next time period. It would keep increasing until this point, until the investment we make are just enough to cover the depreciation of the existing capital per capita, and we don't create or destroy anything. So that's the equilibrium here. This is where that thing is equal to that thing. And you can see that in the previous slides in the mathematics. If we start from this point, however, if we're here for some reason, then the investment we do is not enough uh, to cover all the depreciation. Therefore, some of the capital per capita would be destroyed. We couldn't invest enough. And in the next time period, the capital per capita would decrease, eventually reaching the equilibrium. Now, this is the equilibrium. What happens if, for some reason, the country decides to, to save more? Well, the saving curve is basically shifted up. Right? Now, S prime is bigger than S. The new equilibrium is here. It's just the intersection of these two points. So now, the everybody in the country would have more capital per capita because new capital would have been created by investing more. So instead of me having two factories, uh, I would probably have five. But we'll see that this does not mean that I can consume more. This is not uh, a proxy for consumption. Just remember this now. The capital per capita, which is not always gadgets, is increases. What will happen now if the cost of capital or the cost of labor increases. Well, that curve would simply change position like that. The new equilibrium would be here. Therefore, everybody would have less capital per capita. For instance, if we have new people coming into the country, N would increase. So the curve would shift here. So everybody with the same output would have less capital per capita. That's, that's natural. <coughs> but now, and this is, the text just explains these two graphs, nothing more. If you understand how the shifts, inf the shifts influence the, the equilibrium points, then you're fine. This text now explains that graph. I'll do the same now. I'll explain this graph. And this goes back to the idea that more capital per capita does not always mean more consumption. In fact, there is only one value of the capital per capita, that is the golden value that maximizes consumption, and we'll see why. Okay, so <coughs> this is uh, the output per person, f of k, small f of k, the green curve. Okay? This is the depreciation, as we saw it before. Now, if we invest, so what is, first of all, what is the stationary state? We know that if we have a given investment curve, let's assume 
the investment curve is like that. It crosses, it crosses the depreciation curve here. Okay? Right, right there. Just assume that. Then we invest this amount. Ugh. We invest this amount. And the consumption is simply the output minus investment. So the consumption is in fact the difference between the output curve and the depreciation curve, right? This difference here is the consumption. And you see that the consumption is maximized here when that difference is highest, right? So there's only one level of capital per capita, which is the golden level, where the difference is maximum. If you have an equilibrium point here, that difference will not be maximum. You would have more capital stock per capita. I would have five factories instead of two. But that doesn't mean I can consume more. Because to consume, I need money. Okay? And mathematically, it can be shown that the maximum, the optimal um, gold level of capital can be uh, graphically calculated by uh, taking the derivative or the slope of the production function at the point where the slope equals the slope of the uh, of the depreciation curve. So at that point, the slope, the derivative here, the slope of the curve is equal to that slope. So it can be shown that this is how you can graphically determine it. Is that clear? So more capital per capita does not mean more consumption. But whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on, let's say, what's important to you. If you want to maximize consumption in your country today, then uh, probably you would be happy if you have th if you have this point here. If you don't want to maximize consumption, if you, let's say, want to still have fairly good consumption, but you want to have more capital per capita, <coughs> then uh, that's better. So as I said, this slide explains that graph. Um <coughs> Actually, that slide, yes, so that slide basically tells you if you have a rich country, rich country defined as more capital per capita, what can the rich country do to increase consumption is to decrease investment, right? So the country should stop creating so much capital per capita, but create more consumption. In the same sense, the, a poor country here, poor country here, can increase consumption by investing more. Basically, moving to that point. Uh, so these empirical implications of the solo model should be clear by just keeping in mind that basic logic of what happens when you move the curves around. Oh. Oh. So this basic uh, empirical value, empirical results. Output per worker should be higher and, and so on. I leave that to you. I mean, it's really, if you understood the graph so far, this is, this is uh, trivial. The only thing that I want to finish with, so this is... Um, Yes, what I mentioned just now for rich countries and poor countries. Some critics, that's important. First of all, the saving is kind of um, exogenous. Somebody decides what the saving rate should be. It's not included in the model. Second thing, we completely ignore the technological progress A. We completely ignore uh, the influence of Let's say we have two countries with the same capital per capita, the same savings rate, the same depreciation, but different levels of technology. How would, what would that mean for their, for their well-being? We completely ignore that. <coughs> of course, human capital is not incorporated, so education. If you invest in education now, you minimize consum well, you reduce consumption with the potential promise for uh, increased consumption in the future. 
In fact, the biggest critic of the solo model, the biggest one, is equilibrium, as let's say standard economics. The solo model always assumes that the countries converge to whatever equilibrium, and the equilibrium is determined by uh, depreciation rate, by production function. There is very weak empirical evidence that countries ever reach an equilibrium. At least we haven't found, maybe Japan nowadays, but um, except for Japan, we haven't found a country which has reached a stable equilibrium point without changing, without any changes. This has to do with the fact that the solo model ignores trade. We don't have any net exports. In real life, we know we have business cycles, oscillations in GDP, uh, which is definitely not an equilibrium. So that's the biggest critique of the solo model. It doesn't tell you how to reach an equilibrium. It just assumes there is an equilibrium, eventually you would reach it. If that's true or not, we need empirical evidence. And so far, we don't have it. And these are the questions. Uh, wait. These are the questions. Yes, so that's all. If you have any questions, I have time. No, so thank you.